April 11th, 1741. It's the morning after the Battle of Mulvitz. Frederick has had his first victory, and he's not happy about it. See, his general had told him to flee, that his army was about to be destroyed, so he had done so. Yet then that same general had turned the battle around and delivered victory. Meanwhile, Frederick had wandered in the dark, nearly being captured and hiding in a house until morning. He was embarrassed, but he had learned a great deal. Mulvitz would be his school. Never again would he abdicate command to another or cut his losses when victory seemed possible. His cavalry had performed poorly, he needed to do something about that, but he also saw how his advancing infantry had terrified the enemy. Huh, something to note there. And though improvements did need to be made, he had his victory. He had Silesia. And he would fight to keep it for 22 years. Thanks so much to Ren for being a simple and effective way to help make a difference in the climate crisis. Learn more after the episode. Frederick's invasion of Silesia, on the thinnest pretenses and without even a formal declaration of war, catapulted him to international stardom. Across Europe, people scrambled to learn all they could about this rash and dynamic young king. How had a nothing power like Prussia, a scattershot part of the Holy Roman Empire, caught the mighty Habsburgs napping? Sales of his book, The Anti-Machiavel, shot up, and his correspondence with Voltaire, written on both sides with the intention that it be shared, circulated among philosophers. When Frederick had invaded, he told his ministers that he wanted to see his name in the gazettes, and boy did he get that. But in truth, this was not all about Frederick's enormous ego. It was also about putting Prussia on the map. When he came to the throne, Prussia was neither a fully independent kingdom nor a state in the Holy Roman Empire. It existed in the Shadowland in between. The soil was sandy and poor, its territory separated, and the population only numbered 2.2 million. Meaning, forget a superpower like Habsburg Austria. Before the war, Prussia's biggest rival was neighboring Saxony. Yet by invading Silesia, he announced that Prussia was attempting to join the great nations of Europe. This wasn't some German state. This was a kingdom. But despite his boldness crossing the border, when he entered Silesia, most of Europe assumed Austria would crush this upstart. But then Mulwitz proved them wrong and changed everything. It exposed Austria's weakness. And if you've ever watched any of our episodes on the Siege of Vienna or Jewish Pirates or the Thirty Years' War, you'd know that about 80% of Europe at this time was spoiling to take a swing at the Habsburgs. Many in Europe, including Frederick, also fundamentally hated the idea of Maria Theresa, a woman heading one of the great powers. Not only did they not want her ruling Austria, they also wanted to break the tradition of the Habsburg line automatically being elected Holy Roman Emperor. Of course, in this case, a woman couldn't legally be elected, but Maria was pushing for her husband's election. So, sensing weakness after Mulwitz, France, Spain, Bavaria, and Saxony pounced. And thus, the First Silesian War became merely a part of the much wider War of Austrian Succession. And if all of that sounds complicated, it's because it is. Sadly, we're going to have to gloss over a bunch of stuff since this is a series about Frederick and not this unbelievably convoluted war where countries change sides faster than Lokis in the MCU. But basically what you need to know is that at Mulvitz, Frederick had rung the dinner bell. Habsburg's back on the menu, boys. Get a piece while it lasts. <laughs> a coalition formed around Prussia with the hope of carving up Habsburg lands in a partition. But Frederick worried that if that happened, these powers might get too powerful and overwhelm Prussia as well. So Frederick's diplomats contacted their Austrian counterparts and cut a deal. They signed a secret truce so that both could recover strength while their troops still pretended to be at war. This lasted for a few months until Frederick, worried Maria Theresa was coming back for Silesia, reputed the treaty and joined the Allied campaign in Bohemia. But not long after Frederick arrived, the Allied march toward Vienna broke up. So turned out, it was Frederick's army that took the blow when Maria Theresa's brother-in-law, Charles of Lorraine, arrived with 30,000 troops to take the invaded territory back. And on May 17, 1742, pursuing Austrians caught half of the Prussian army. Dug in around a village to meet the Austrian attack, they were instructed to hold until the king's part of the army could arrive and take direct command. Frederick was not about to let a mere general steal his thunder again, okay? But once he arrived, it was still a confused engagement. Frederick drove off the Austrian cavalry with a mounted charge backed by artillery, but it was a dry summer day, and soon huge banks of dust obscured any vision of the battlefield. Central command broke down. 
cavalry on both sides got lost, then quit the battle to pillage the enemy baggage trains. It then became a house-to-house -house brawl of infantry and artillery through the burning town that only ended when Frederick led a huge square of 24 battalions into the Austrian flank. Now, while technically a draw, the Austrians abandoned the field, giving Frederick the victory. Not to mention, diplomatically, he also won out. For when the British pushed both parties to the negotiating table, Frederick once again was allowed to keep almost all of Silesia. Two months later, the First Silesian War was over. Yet he knew this was a temporary peace, and that there was work to do. While the Prussian infantry was solid, the cavalry had performed poorly in both battles. So he went about restructuring and reforming his cavalry forces to be more disciplined and aggressive so they'd serve him better when Maria Theresa came for her captured province. Oh, and she was going to. In fact, Maria Theresa had flipped the script. Two years before, she'd been fighting alone against a major coalition, but now she'd set up a new anti-French alliance bankrolled by Britain. And with Russia and Saxony interested in joining, Frederick worried she was about to seek revenge. So then he built a rival alliance between Prussia, Bavaria, Sweden, and two German states, with the goal of restoring the Bavarian lands taken so far in the war. France also declared its support. Then on August 15, 1744, Frederick crossed back into Bohemia, launching the Second Silesian War, which went sideways almost immediately. The campaign depended on the French tying up Charles of Lorraine and his Austrians in the West, so he couldn't return to Bohemia. But that went out the window when King Louis XV fell ill leading the French army and Charles disengaged. Then Saxony switched sides away from France and allied with Austria, meaning Prussia now had an enemy on its border. Meanwhile, Austrian guerrilla forces hounded Frederick out of Bohemia by just savaging his supply lines. And realizing this was unattainable, he pulled back to defend Silesia. Things got worse. Austria formed a new alliance with Britain, Saxony, and the Dutch Republic, with secret plans to partition Prussia the same way the powers had tried to carve up the Habsburg lands. Then Frederick's ally, the Holy Roman Emperor, dropped dead, and his son made peace with Austria, and finally in May, Charles of Lorraine crossed the giant mountains into Lower Silesia, leading a force of 60,000 Austrian and Hungarian troops, plus their Saxon allies. Frederick knew he had to act. Battle of Hohenfriedberg, June 4th, 1745, 7 a.m. Frederick told his troops to leave their campfires burning when they performed the night march. In darkness, they'd slipped out of camp and crowded across a bridge, right past the Austrian forces, for they were not the objective. Instead, Frederick wants to hit the Saxons first and destroy them before rolling up on the rest of the Austrian forces. Oh, but they've been spotted. Shots ring out. Prussian and Saxon cavalry clash together in a vicious night battle. Pistol flashes light up gleaming sword blades. The Saxon camp begins to mobilize, but the infantry pushes through and the Saxon formations start to dissolve. By first light, the Saxon force is already routed, and Frederick's right turns to engage the main Austrian force. Hours of gunpowder and blood follow, and the next day, Frederick sits on his horse in the courtyard of the palace he's taken as his own. He has won his greatest victory to date, and now he is honoring the troops that, more than anything, made it possible. The Bayreuth Dragoons, his heavy cavalry. At the climax of the battle, when things had still hung in the balance, they had spotted a hole in the Austrian line. And by charging through that gap, they had overrun 20 enemy battalions and captured 2,500 prisoners. They'd broken the Austrians and only taken 94 casualties doing so. Now they parade their war trophies into the square, 67 battle flags of Austrian and Saxon units torn from enemy hands. There was still fighting to do, but when the king returned to Berlin, he would be doing so under a new name, Frederick the Great. And, you know, actually, on that note of fighting still to do, I kind of want to switch gears and talk for a second about how we can all help battle the climate crisis. You know, as I've looked around for some of the best practices to help out in this space, one method that kept coming up was carbon offset programs. Though I've always been super skeptical of those. I mean, sure, they can theoretically work, but their current marketplace is set up in such a way that many programs seem to be either inefficient at best or at worst, basically incentivize scams. But then we learned that our Nebula friend, Sam from Wendover, who actually made an awesome video about said skepticisms, by the way, had been talking with a group called Ren, who he thinks is pretty much as good as it gets in the carbon offset market. So I wanted to learn more for myself. 
Turns out, REN is a website where you can calculate your carbon footprint, then offset it by funding a diverse portfolio of carbon reduction projects. Things like tree planting, mineral weathering, rainforest protection, etc. However, again, as I've learned in the past, these sort of services are really only as good as the accuracy of their project evaluations. Which is why I really like to see that one of REN's key differentiating points is actually how focused they are on these small details. And not just at a project's inception, mind you, but also how it progresses over time, which is just really important. For example, one of these well-watched projects that's near and dear to both my and our studio director Jeff's heart is biochar in California, which helps prevent wildfires in old-growth forests by removing dead and flammable trees and then using a cutting-edge process to turn the tree's biomass into biochar, keeping carbon out of the air for like thousands of years. Which, side note, is just very, very cool. And you know, you can actually learn more about them and all of Ren's projects for yourself over on their super clear website that goes into just a ton of fun minutia. But you know what else you can do on their website? Answer a few questions about your lifestyle to help calculate your carbon footprint, and then learn some nifty ways to help reduce that. Plus, you can even set up a monthly offset to reduce your personal contributions to the climate crisis, which turned out to be less expensive than I thought it would. And this is a cool thing. Right now, Ren is offering the first 100 people who sign up with our link in the description one month of carbon emissions offset for free. Look, I want to be very clear here. We all know that our individual carbon emissions are only one small part of the problem, but it really is going to take a lot to end the climate crisis. And you can start helping out today by learning more on ren.co slash start slash extra credits. Thanks, everyone. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding.